around the fairgrounds was probably about the end of town and there used to be a nightclub out there that had uh, Louis Armstrong twice and some really good bands and it, it was rather social. Um, I think it was on Mountain Road and it might have been called Joe's Bar and uh, oh, Santa Fe Kate was the dancer and we all thought oh she was so old and so I'm sure she uh, was much younger than I am at this point and she'd do her dance and uh, it was just uh, really lots of fun. Um, I was dating this guy and uh, I don't know if you know of getting pinned to someone in a fraternity. Uh, and uh, I told my mother that this guy uh, wanted to give me his pin, and she said, oh, you wouldn't, as if, you know, that this was going to be the ruin of me. <laughs> I think my parents both had done a lot of things in their lives that were a lot of fun, and they thought I should do that too. My dad's family came out here before 1900 in, to Silver City. His, his father was a Presbyterian minister and they moved up here to Albuquerque, I believe in 1905. My mom was the oldest of five kids and she and her parents uh, arrived here in 1910 because my grandfather, her dad, had TB, which was a common reason for people to come here. My mom's mother really, I think, only went through the ninth grade, but she had, uh, she raised five kids and all they all went to college and that was important to her. And my mother uh, graduated from college. My dad went to college. I don't believe he was, he graduated, but I think he had a couple of years uh, at UNM. And um, it was just always assumed, I think, that I would, uh, go on to college. There was a really nice girl I knew all the way through elementary and junior high and high school who was so smart and uh, I just was so disappointed because uh, her family didn't seem to think it was important for her to go on to college. And uh, many years later, in fact just within the past year, I ran into this gal and uh, in midlife she did go and get a degree, and uh, I thought, well, that's good. There were no female professors that, uh, I think that was probably the, uh, right in there was a start of uh, women becoming engaged in that field. In those days, mostly when you were married, you didn't work anymore, and so I got married and uh, I had a child and a family, and I didn't work again until my fourth child was in first grade and I worked a year at the Santa Fe New Mexican on the copy desk. And we married my senior year in college and uh, he finished college. He'd been interrupted by having to go to war and so he finished school and then he taught and I, ha I stayed home and had three youngsters and then uh, it wasn't until Meg, our daughter, was in the third grade, I think. I, I started doing some substituting. And again, it was, it was economics at that point. One teacher's salary wasn't going too far with three little kids. There were a, many fewer women working. Now, World War II had some effect on that because when all the men went off to war, the women stepped in and many of those women when the guys came back, the women were lost, uh, were out of a job. I mean, there wasn't any question about it. Women still were the, the housewife, the happy housewife, and uh, she just really got excited about the new brand of, of floor wax. I taught language arts and, and then ended up teaching journalism because I'd had that degree, but I, I didn't have the... Elaine had much more of a journalism career than I did with her work uh, at the journal, is, but that was where women generally went, was to the society page. I was society editor of the Lobo, and uh, I would write about what people were doing, and this person did that, and somebody was going on a vacation, and it was just all pretty much something that you don't do anymore. And when I graduated from college then, 
I got a job on the Albuquerque Journal and was assistant society editor there for a while and then became society editor for a while. And um, during this period of time, I took a year off and went to South America to visit my college roommate who had married a mining engineer and was there and uh, got a job with Braniff Airlines as an airline stewardess in South America. And then uh, came back and uh, uh, they wanted me to come back to the society department, but they had not fired the society editor that they were planning to fire and that I was going to take her position. <laughs> so I got a job on the El Paso Times with the society department uh, for perhaps six months and then this did occur and I came back to Albuquerque and worked in Albuquerque again on the journal. I was at Van Buren the 13 years that I taught uh, and it was uh, it was English or language arts and and part of the time it was journalism when I could haul home the heavy heavy typewriter and type up the articles and then uh, take them back and uh, the journalism class would would uh, put out the uh, paper once once a month I think. The fellow who was giving the radio class at TVI uh, went on to do other things and so I started doing that so for a while I taught the the class in radio broadcasting and um, and then did this Albuquerque Insight interview program once a week for 30 minutes. And that was fun. My first one was Harry Kinney. He was the, the mayor at that time in Albuquerque. And I was really upset about how I was going to do this and scared to death. And so I got all the papers for the last week and I just poured over all the stuff on Albuquerque and I was so worried. And, and so I went in there and, and uh, he came in and he was a he was a never met a stranger kind of guy and he said, "Well, Nancy," he said, "you were Nancy Gass, right?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, I knew your folks." He said, uh, "Rebecca and Gordon," and that's how we started out. So it was <laughs> we just sat there and talked, you know. It was kind of fun. So that was a that was I bless his heart because uh, then I did, I wasn't quite as scared the next time. But yes, I interviewed uh, Linkletter, Art Linkletter, who did the, did the early TV programs on Kids Say the Darndest Things. Well, he was, he was a jerk, I thought. I thought he was a typical used car salesman. I interviewed Pete Domenici. I interviewed Tony Anaya, the fellow who's a, a nudist. But you know, I must say that that man is a kook. But he's a principled kook. He walks the walk. He does what he believes in. And I, I truly have a lot of admiration for him. I really do.